So we've been studying the events of Resurrection Sunday, and the Bible records quite a few key events from that day, though it doesn't tell us everything we'd like to know. Uh, so we've spent several weeks on this, and this morning we'll reach the end of what the Bible says about Resurrection Sunday. Uh, throughout that day, Jesus had appeared to several individual followers or small groups of his followers. And then as those followers gathered together towards Sunday evening, he suddenly appeared in their midst. And last time we finished up considering his words to them in John 20, verse 21, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So now watch with me at what happens next. John 20, verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. And with that, the events that were told about from Resurrection Sunday come to a close. These two verses are intriguing, maybe a little bewildering. I'm going to touch this morning on uh, several passages that are probably, oh, just about the most difficult ones in the New Testament for Protestants, at least. And uh, so I trust God is bigger than our weaknesses here. And um, you come to, we're only having two grace groups tonight because of the, the death in the Franklin's family, but uh, you can go to Eric Ray's grace group tonight with lots of hard questions uh, for him. So you can think of the two grace groups that way. The no questions group, come to mind. And uh, if you've got questions, go ahead and go to Eric's. All right, verse 22, Jesus breathed on them not breathed into them, not like mouth to mouth or something, but uh, breathed on them. Picture him blowing toward them, as we'll talk about later. There were at least 20 people in this room, maybe more. Picture Jesus breathing toward them, blowing toward them. And, and obviously, that was some kind of picture or symbol of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's not a surprise, since the word spirit can also mean breath or wind, like breath or wind. The Spirit of God often works quietly and subtly, yet the effects are powerful. So wind or breath is a good illustration. Breath is also a good spirit of the pic a, a picture of the Spirit because the Spirit sustains life. The Spirit is life-giving, and your breathing is life-sustaining. It's interesting to think about, actually. There are, oh, I don't know, 80 or something of us here in this room, 80 or 90 of us here together, and, and there is a huge amount of breathing going on. But gratefully, we don't all have like a bad cold or allergies or something where it's this like loud wheezing noise, or we'd all hear it. It's actually, there's, there's, a, there's a subtle, a subtle, compression up and down of your chest. There's a, a barely perceptible sound of air passing into and out of your lungs. Yet those breaths that we're not even paying attention to are sustaining the life of every person in this room right now. The miracle of life is happening breath after breath for each one of you. And so Jesus said, the Spirit gives life. His ways are often subtle, as subtle as breath, yet the results are life-giving and life-sustaining. Now, we don't mean by that that the Spirit of God is just the breath of God or a force or a power. The Bible, when the Spirit of God is described in the Bible, He has a mind, He has emotions, He has a will of His own. Father and Son and Spirit are each described with the full attributes of God, yet each is described as a unique person. So that's why we believe that the Bible teaches one God in three persons. God the Son here, Jesus, breathed on his followers and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, we'll talk about the Spirit more in the future. Uh, when our study reaches that day, 50 days after this, when the Spirit came upon the followers of Jesus at the Feast of Pentecost and filled them with power. So when we get there in our study, uh, we'll talk more about that. Uh, but you might have just noticed a problem. If the Spirit was given 50 days after this, after Jesus returned to heaven, what just happened here in John 20? 
what happened on Resurrection Sunday when Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit? And that's not an easy question. Christians disagree about the answer. I'll make a feeble attempt to be helpful. I'm going to mention three possibilities, uh, three of the more likely possibilities. And of course, I have a preference among the three. And I guess since I'm the guy talking, I get to tell you my preference. Uh, But that does not mean that I am right. One possibility is that John 20, 22 is actually referring to what happened 50 days later at Pentecost. Uh, There are many times in the Gospels when the writers organize things in a topical order instead of a chronological order. And that's normal. We do that all the time. Like you come back from a vacation, and if you tell somebody about your vacation, you jump around, you put things together. Like you might tell them about the different restaurants you went to. Who cares if you got it in order? That's not the point. The point is the restaurants, right? Uh, The Gospels sometimes put things in chronological order. Sometimes they put things together topically. So is it possible that John is writing topically here, and he isn't trying to tell us when Pentecost happened, but that it happened? Uh, So that's one common idea. The problem with that is that John uses time words in verse 22. It says, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So whatever happened in verse 22 happened in the same room with the same people at the same time as verse 21, which clearly happened on Resurrection Sunday. So it's, it's, it's hard for me to imagine that John's just talking about something that happened 50 days later. Something happened here. A second possibility is that this is a distinct giving of the Spirit, a separate giving of the Spirit from what happened uh, 50 days later. Um, this, in other words, the Spirit was given one way here and in another way later. And it, it's just hard for me to believe that that's true. And Jesus made it so clear that he had to, if he didn't ascend back to the Father, the Spirit wouldn't come. He had to ascend first, and the Spirit would come after he ascended. Six weeks after this, they were still waiting. And then when the Spirit came, he made such a remarkable difference in the lives of the disciples. If the Spirit came upon them here in some way, there's no indication it made any difference at all when the difference at Pentecost was so remarkable. So I I, I don't know how you'd piece together some explanation of how this is some kind of different receiving of the Holy Spirit. Um, so I think we're, we're better to go with the third possibility, and that is that Jesus was picturing and promising the coming of the Spirit, which would happen 50 days later. Picturing and promising what would happen later. Maybe that's similar to the washing of their feet, which Jesus did to picture and promise the work he was going to do on the cross uh, the next day. But why did he do that? Why on Resurrection Sunday did Jesus picture and promise the giving of the Holy Spirit? And I'm just going to give you a guess, all right? My guess is that Jesus was seeking to make it very clear to them that the gift of the Spirit was from him. And that was important because the Spirit was going to come after he was gone. He had said, we read it in the scripture reading, I will send him to you. Jesus wasn't going to leave his disciples as orphans. He wasn't going to abandon them. He was going to personally send the Spirit to be with them after he was gone. Uh, So I think of it like a a birthday present to a small child. Maybe the present is from grandma, and grandma mailed the present because grandma's on the other side of the country. But for a small, if if the child's small enough, it's going to be really hard for them to understand that this present is from grandma because grandma's not there. So how can this be from grandma? So maybe on the birthday, you get grandma on the phone or, you know, today on video on the computer and and you talk to grandma while the child opens the gift to try to help the child understand grandma's not here, but this is from grandma, right? I know that's a really down-to-earth illustration, but I suspect that that Jesus is doing something similar. The Spirit would come after Jesus was out of sight, gone, return to the Father, yet it was the Spirit was a personal gift from Jesus to his followers. And so I suspect that he was picturing that and promising that to them with this picture of him breathing on them so that they would not forget that. And when the Spirit come, they would say, this is what Jesus did. This is what Jesus said. This is what Jesus promised. This is from Jesus. That is a guess. 
but uh, it is my best suspicion about what's going on here. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, first of all, it means that you re- when, when you received the Spirit of God, when you were saved, you received a personal gift from Jesus to you. Regardless of why Jesus did this, his breathing on them and saying, receive the Holy Spirit, shows us that the Spirit is from Jesus. So the Spirit that you received at salvation is a gift from Jesus to you because he loves you. And secondly, the Spirit is necessary because you have been sent by Jesus. And that is clear when we look at the context. Verse 21, so Jesus said to them again, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. You see the very clear connection there. Jesus sends us out on his mission to continue and complete the work of God. And we are completely incapable of accomplishing that mission without the Spirit of God. And the Bible illustrates that for us clearly when it uses very similar language. Greek translation of Genesis 2, 7 Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The breath of God turned a pile of dirt into a living being. So Jesus sends you toward people, like we said two weeks ago, toward his children, to love them like he loves them, with the message of forgiveness. And you are as capable of carrying out that mission as a pile of dirt is capable of springing to life as a human being. You're as good as dirt. And actually, the Bible writers rejoice in that. He remembers our frame. He knows we're just dust. Psalm 103. And so the Spirit gives power and strength and ability that we don't have. The Spirit brings life and power. We're just the branch, but Jesus is the vine, and His life and power flow into our branch by the Spirit. And so, rather than giving in to our normal, self-confident tendencies, we have to learn to be people who live in continual, prayerful dependence on God's Spirit. This is something that I, is just increasingly important to me with my children. As I think about, my kids know a lot, you know, a lot of Bible stuff. You know, they've been in church their whole lives. But what do I really long for for my children? And at this point in my life, as I look at them and as I think about what I understand about Scripture, I, there are very few things I long for my children more than for them to learn that they need God Because my experience and my wife's experience growing up in Christian homes was a life of self-dependence. I'm a good kid. I'm doing fine. Everybody likes me. And I long for my children to learn, you're not a good kid. You're not doing fine. You need God. Every day, all the time. So John 20, 21 teaches us that the Spirit is a personal gift from Jesus to you and that the Spirit is the only way you can have life and power on the mission to which Jesus sends you. That brings us then to verse 23. Same same words of Jesus. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. All right. First of all, there's a lot of discussion about the meaning of the words forgive and retain here. Um, But I think the general idea is obvious. Either your sins have been forgiven or they've not been forgiven and you still bear them yourself. Uh, Either they've been taken away from you or else they've been left on you. Uh, this This is about forgiveness. But what we struggle with in this verse is the idea that the followers of Jesus forgive people that the followers of Jesus play some role in the forgiving or unforgiving of the sins of other people. Uh, now I don't, I, I don't usually start explaining what a verse means by explaining what it doesn't mean, uh, because it's a lot easier to prove what a verse doesn't mean than what it does. Uh, but in this case, it is important to lay a foundation for us. If 
you were talking to a knowledgeable Roman Catholic about the forgiveness of sins, they would certainly bring you to this verse in John 20. They would bring you here. They would also bring you to Matthew 18, where Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Now, then they would also probably point your attention to, and that's Matthew 16, not 18. They would also point your attention to 2 Corinthians 5.18, where Paul says that God gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. And on the basis of those verses, they would explain to you that while only God can forgive sins, you need the authority of the church and specifically the priesthood to mediate that forgiveness to you. This is called the, you know, most commonly called confession, but it's the sacrament of penance and reconciliation. And this sacrament exists because, and I'm, I'm speaking in their words and their terms based on their catechism here. The sacrament exists because Jesus entrusted the ministry of reconciliation to the apostles who then passed along that authority to Roman Catholic bishops and then Roman Catholic bishops have the authority to pass along that authority to priests by virtue, I'm, I'm quoting from the Catholic catechism, by virtue of the sacrament of holy orders, Priests have the power to forgive all sins. The disclosure or confession of sins to a priest is an essential element of the sacrament. By the priest's absolution, God grants to the penitent pardon and peace. Now, the priests not only grant pardon to the one confessing their sins to them, but they also, quote, determine the manner of satisfaction or what kind of penance you need to do to be reconciled back to God and the church. At this point, it gets confusing because there is the obvious question of which sins you confess, which sins require penance. And the confession says that you, you certainly must confess all of your serious sins. That's what the Roman Catholics call your mortal sins. You have to make sure you confess those. And then the confession of your other sins, your more routine daily sins, which they call venial sins, is, according to the confession, quote, recommended, though not strictly necessary. But since then, confession of your sins to a priest and his absolution does not remove the temporal punishments for your sins, you can also obtain indulgences which lessen the temporal punishments for your sins by drawing upon the stored-up merits of Jesus and all of the Roman Catholic saints who were not only good but super abundantly good and stored up extra credit merit. One benefit of indulgences may be a shortened stay in purgatory. And indulgences for a time were available through money that has since been changed, and indulgences today are only available through good works such as prayers and charitable activities. Now, the reason I wanted to share those things with you, and, and I hope you can see, I've been very careful in how I've said those things to you. I've tried to use their words and just say it their way, because there is all too much disrespect in the way these things are discussed. And this is not impersonal doctrine to us. We all have family, friends who are Roman Catholics, and so this belief system is important to us, and we are often trying to talk about the gospel with Roman Catholics. But the question I want to ask you is, do you think the New Testament evidence supports what I just described to you? Do you think that is Bible teaching? For example, when you read John 20, verse 23, yes, this is a hard verse, okay? 
But do you think John 20, verse 23 supports the conclusion that there is a special class of priests today and a sacrament of penance and a system of necessary confession to those priests and a priestly authority to grant you absolution and to determine what kind of penance you need to do for your sins and even a system of indulgences that you can earn to lessen the amount of your punishment? And I would just say the Bible does not possibly support such conclusions. There is nothing in the New Testament about indulgences, purgatory, or confession to a priest. As a matter of fact, the the whole idea of a special priestly class has no basis whatsoever in the New Testament. And if you read the Roman Catholic Catechism, they don't even try to argue for it from the New Testament. They just say that the God who gave his people priests in the Old Testament would not leave his people without priests today. Well, ah, there's a good New Testament answer for that. And it's sad because they agree that Jesus is the one priest. And then they go on to say in the Catechism that though Jesus is the one priest, we still need mediating priests to mediate Jesus' one priesthood to us. And that is exactly what Hebrews says we don't need any longer. So uh, do you know that the word Protestant comes from what word? Protest. Because in the 14th century, there began to arise significant protests against the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. And in the 16th century, those protests began to become very widespread in Europe. And you know that one of the most significant of those protests came from Martin Luther, who was a Roman Catholic priest. And when he began protesting, he was certainly still a Roman Catholic priest. And if you read what he wrote, you'll see that. He wrote a list of 95 protests against this very sacrament. If you read Luther's 95 Theses, and those of you who are history buffs would have fun reading what he actually wrote, it is in Theses number... What's the singular of that? Thesis number one? Number two. It is in Thesis number two that he says this is about the sacrament of penance. That is what the 95 Theses are about, this sacrament of the Roman Catholic Church. And he wrote in those 95 points like a good Roman Catholic priest. And if you read them, you'll see he was still trying to be a good Roman Catholic priest. And he was what he was, the reason why he wrote those was for a scholarly debate at his university in Germany. He was not saying, I'm going to start a revolution, but he was trying to open up a public debate about these things. Uh, but within two months, those, that list he had written had been spread all across Europe. And the protest about the Roman Catholic Church became a movement so significant that it reshaped the course of Western civilization. And that's not just a Protestant talking, okay? Non-Christian historians will tell you that the Reformation reshaped the direction of Western civilization. But it was sparked by a protest against the sacrament of penance. So if we turn our attention back now to John 20, verse 23, this is admittedly a difficult verse, but we do not, based on this verse and the others I've mentioned, we do not have to create a system of priests and confession and purgatory and indulgences so that this verse has meaning. Okay, that is not our only option this morning. What is the meaning? Well, that's where the challenge is. Uh, Let's start with this question. To whom was Jesus speaking? Well, 10 of the 12 disciples were there. We know that because Judas wasn't there and we're told Thomas wasn't there. 10 of the 12 disciples were there. Cleopas was there and his friend because they had come back with their report and all of those women that had gone to the tomb. So we know for sure that there were 18 or so people there. That's for certain. And then how many others? You know, how many other Galilean pilgrims were there? How many other disciples of Jesus had heard news of resurrection and had gathered. So we're going to say there were at least 18, and there could have been 30 or 40 or 50 or who knows how many people gathered there by that time on Sunday evening. Why does that matter? Because Jesus wasn't talking to just a group of people who were going to become the apostles and giving them some priestly authority to go forgive sins. He was talking to a big group of followers, including men and women both. He was speaking essentially to the church right? Not to some special class of people. So that, first of all, is important. Then 
Secondly, what is the context of the promise? Well, let's just read through it again, okay? Start in verse 21. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. So the forgiving and retaining of sins is directly connected to the mission of the whole church. And as we saw last two weeks ago in Luke 24, that mission is that the message of repentance for the... For what? For the forgiveness of sins might be preached among all the nations. Okay? The whole church takes the message of forgiveness to the whole world. When we deliver that message, we are delivering a promise and a guarantee from God. If you repent and believe the gospel, your sins are forgiven. How do you know? Because I told you. Well, who am I to tell you? Well, I'm not really anybody, but I told you what God said because he sent me as his messenger. And I told you that God promised that if you'll repent and believe the gospel, you are forgiven. You can believe me. Sounds a little authoritative, right? That that is what's going on here. Jesus did not send you on a mission to say, by the way, I think there's a slight chance that you might be able to be forgiven, something having to do with Jesus, not real sure, you might want to check it out. <laughs> Which is how some people do evangelism. He sent you with authority, he guarantees it, and you're the voice to take the guarantee. At the same time, you also bring the guarantee that if they will not repent and believe the gospel, they are not forgiven. It is certain. It is guaranteed. They still bear all the guilt of their sin before God because they will not repent and believe. You can say to them, I tell you, you are not forgiven. You are in trouble with God and you will go to hell if you do not repent and believe the gospel. Well, who am I to tell them that? Again, I'm nobody, but I'm a messenger of somebody who said that and guaranteed it. And so what I say to you is true. If you do not repent and believe, you are condemned. Guaranteed. You see the authority. We are not priests who can act as a mediator between people and God. We do not decide who is forgiven and decide what penalties they receive for their sin. Only God knows the human heart. But we take the guarantees of God in His Word and we speak those guarantees to others and that is one serious calling. It's not for the bishops. It's not for the priests. It's for you. It's your calling. Think of the baptisms that we did last Sunday. None of us can forgive the sins of those who were baptized, nor can we know their hearts for certain. But when they publicly declare their repentance and faith, we said to them, based on your profession of repentance and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, we believe you're forgiven. We believe you're in God's family. We now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, right? And then what happens if, as time passes, their lives do not show repentance and faith? What if they reject the gospel or begin to live in consistent rebellion against God Jesus said in Matthew 18 that one of us should go to them and challenge them. And if they don't respond, two or three of us should go to them and challenge them. And if they don't respond, who next calls them to repentance? The priests. Yeah. <laughs> You're right, the church. Doesn't that make sense with what happened in John 20? Jesus breathed on the whole church. He gave the Spirit to the whole church. He sent the whole church on his mission. And so Matthew 18 says, you, the entire church calls them to repentance. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, then you have to consider them to be unsaved and unforgiven. Listen to what Jesus said. Let that person be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. 
Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Who's he talking to? The church. When the church says to someone, based on your refusal to repent and your insistence on living in rebellion against God, we can no longer treat you as a brother or sister in Christ. That is heavy. I can't forgive, I can't condemn, yet I can speak the clear promises of God. Those who repent are forgiven. Those whose lives show a stubborn unrepentance are condemned. And that message comes from the entire church because we're all the ambassadors of reconciliation. Jesus sent us on that mission, and it is sober. Now, I get it, okay? Those things make us feel kind of uncomfortable. (laughs) None of us get excited about the strength of those things that we're reading there. It, It is much more comfortable to say that God is the only one who knows men's hearts and God is the only one who can forgive and it's not really any of our business. Okay, now that was one of those classic uh, verbal tricks because I just ran three things right in a row, two of which were very true and one of which was very false. I said, God is the only one who knows men's hearts and God is the only one who can forgive and it's not really any of our business, right? That is very true, very true, very false. God called you to that business the business of souls, the business of forgiveness and unforgiveness, the business of being an ambassador of reconciliation. And sometimes the Bible talks about that in stronger language than we're used to. Let me show you two other examples of that. They're in your handout. One is 1 Corinthians 9.22. Paul says, I have become all things to all men so that I may by all means... What? Paul... You're not a very good theologian, Paul. <laughs> Paul, who wrote Romans and Galatians and Ephesians, I think he knows that God alone can save. Yet that Paul who taught us that God alone can save says, listen, I will give up any freedom I have to give up if, I, if there might be any way I might save somebody. You see, he's not quite as afraid of that as we are because he knows his role is serious. And look at James 5.20. You might say, well, that was just Paul. Okay, but here's what James writes to the church. He who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Yikes. That's not to apostles or bishops or priests. Any of you who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death. Ah, yes, it's only God who actually saves the person. You're just the messenger. But let's, this is just one of those times when I just say to us, let's not be smarter than the Bible. Let's not be more clever than the Bible itself. He who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. You see how serious this is? All right, have you had enough hard text for one morning? Oh, we got a big one coming. Go with me to 2 Corinthians 5. (laughs) Not 5, 2. 2 Corinthians 2. All right, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 5. But if any has caused sorrow, if any person has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much, to all of you. All right, so pause right there. Paul was writing to the Corinthians about a specific situation that they all knew about. And Paul's writing about it very tactfully. He says... Now, if anybody has caused sorrow, when they all knew who he was talking about, the situation he was talking about, 
But he doesn't want to go too far. He doesn't want to say too much. So he's being careful. But there was a man who had caused a very painful situation. The word pain uh, is used... Forms of the word pain are used like five or six times in the opening verses of this chapter. There was a person who had caused a lot of pain in that church, including for Paul, but to the church more broadly. We don't know what that was. There's a lot of debate about that. It doesn't matter a whole lot, okay? But Paul says, if anybody's caused sorrow, he's caused sorrow. It's not just about me. It's the whole church that has gone through this pain and sorrow caused by this person. Now, verse 6 Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted by the majority. Now, again, right there, you just stop and say, okay, I would not have used the word punishment. The idea of the church punishing anybody is not fun. I understand that, but let's not be smarter than the Bible. And based on 1 Corinthians 5, almost certainly what that means is that the church had to come to this person who was continuing in his rebellion against God, and they had exhorted him and exhorted him and the church had to stop associating with him as a brother in Christ. That's what Paul told them to do in 1 Corinthians 5. They had to proclaim to that man the promise of God. You aren't repenting. You are condemned. You are not our brother in Christ. Paul says at the end of verse 6 that what they... Well, he says, the, it's, sorry, the opening word of verse 6, he uses the word sufficient. What they did was sufficient. It didn't need to go any further than that because apparently at that point, the man finally did repent, which was the point, right? The goal. Now read verses 7 through 9 with me. I start in verse 6, though, to see the sentence. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted by the majority. So that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. For to this end also I wrote, so that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Boy, there was a lot here that they had to obey. They had to, uh, they had to obey the call to come to this brother in Christ and begin to challenge him and confront him. They had to obey the call for the whole church to exhort him to obedience. They had to obey the call to punish, to say to him, you are no longer our brother in Christ. They had to obey all those things. And now they have to obey again. Now they have to obey Paul's call to love him and forgive him and accept him and not overwhelm him with sorrow. All of that required obedience to God because it was uncomfortable. Nobody wanted to do it. Now, look at verse 10. But one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ. So here's the Apostle Paul, and he is deferring to the church. He's not saying, hey, I'm the apostle. I'll tell you who's forgiven and who's not. He's saying, listen, if you've forgiven this man, I've forgiven him too, right? And you, you know, again, we might say, wait a second. The church in Corinth can't forgive anyone. Paul can't forgive anyone. Only God can. That's true. But the church declared the promises of God. You are refusing to repent. You are not saved. Wait, you are repenting? You are forgiven. You are loved. You are accepted. When the church forgave him, then Paul did also. Now, those may be startling verses if you haven't considered them before, but they're God's words, and they describe the serious role of all of the followers of Jesus in declaring the promise of forgiveness to those who repent and unforgiveness to those who will not. Now, look down at verse 14. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death to death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? 
If you're a follower of Jesus, you carry around with you the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Christ. To some people, that is a beautiful aroma of life, and the result for them is life. Your life, your example, your testimony, your witness results in their forgiveness and life. But for other people, the aroma of Christ is a stench. The message of the cross is foolishness. And your life and example and testimony and witness result only in their death because they reject Christ and they refuse repentance. You're like this little magnet that goes around and people are either drawn to Jesus or they're pushed away. Now, hopefully not because of you. I'm assuming here that we're not the ones pushing people away. But your good, right, Christ-like testimony will sometimes be a stench to people who are perishing. Who's adequate for these things? I wanted to bring us to those words because I think that is exactly the conclusion we should draw after we read John 20, verse 23. So go back there. Let's just look at it one more time. Verse 21, end of verse 21. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Verse 23, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Who is adequate for these things? Doesn't that make sense there? Who is adequate for these things? What's the answer? Verse 22, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And actually, if we went back to 2 Corinthians and we kept reading in 2 Corinthians, we'd find that Paul gives the exact same answer. It is the Spirit who makes us adequate as ministers of the new covenant. Only the Spirit of God makes us adequate to bring the promises of God. Promises of life and death, blessing and condemnation, forgiveness and guilt. Maybe this little illustration would help you as we finish up this morning. Some people have jobs that involve bearing news, messages to people. You know, like some people have the job of telling the cart boy or girl at the grocery store that there are a lot of carts in the parking lot and you need to go get them, right? Some people have jobs like that. They're, they're passing along messages like, you need to go get all the carts back. Other people have more serious jobs, like people who work the military, the police department, bringing death notifications to people. Somebody in your family has been killed. Somebody in your family has died. I know we would probably prefer to be the messengers of the go get the carts kind of message. But God called you to be a messenger of the life and death kind of message. And he makes you adequate by personally, Jesus makes you adequate by personally giving you the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because without his spirit, you're as adequate as dirt for this sober, serious responsibility.